हेलो फ्रेंड्स सो कॉन्टिन्यू विद ट्रेडिशन वी विल बी स्टार्टिंग विद इंटीग्रेटेड ऑर्थो रेडियोपैथ सेशन वेयर डॉक्टर सुशील विल बी टॉकिंग टू यू अबाउट द बोन ट्यूमर्स एंड मी अलोंग विद डॉक्टर प्रवीण विल बी टेकिंग केयर ऑफ द रेडियोलॉजी एंड द पैथोलॉजी पार्ट ऑफ द बोन ट्यूमर्स व्हिच विल बी वेरी हेल्पफुल फॉर यू इन द अपकमिंग नीट एग्जाम सो विदाउट वेस्टिंग मच टाइम लेट्स स्टार्ट द डिस्कशन ऑन द बोन ट्यूमर्स सो डॉक्टर सुशील सो हेलो फ्रेंड्स सो दिस सेशन होपफुली विल बी वेरी हेल्पफुल टू ऑल ऑफ यू integrated with radiology and its respective pathology so i'll give you a brief idea how the bone is formed right so you should know before you go on to the abnormal things you should know how the normal things look like and how a bone is formed see bone is a simple collection of three things a combination of three common components and they are your cells the proteins and the minerals right so cell and protein is what you call a organic matrix which is combined with the minerals to give you a normal bone so simply to call a bone normal we must have all these components in a normal proportion okay so cells basically in the bones that we have the osteoblast and the osteoclast and the third kind of cell the osteocytes which are again the mature osteoblast which are entrapped by the proteins right so we have two major bone cells the blast and the clast and the protein the type 1 procollagen so how these two things they look like on a normal uh, this evaluation that will be taken up by dr pravi Uh, very well, sir. Sir, actually, uh, before we move to the histopathology, always there is a complexity in understanding the histology part. So, what we'll do, friends, we'll first start with the normal histology part here. Now, as you see in uh, uh, this diagram, let's start with the this diagram first. So, what you see, this is actually a compact bone. Compact bone is basically produced by an osteoblast. Sorry. So, and it is broken down in few also bones by the osteoclast there. Now, what you see here is actually this bone bone, the round round that you see, actually the bone bone. The same thing I have shown in the next image in a higher magnification. So what is at the center? <coughs> look, this round thing you see here, this round thing is actually a complete osteon. Look, this is how actually I have made in a animation model one. When you see at the center, you see this area. This is the Havertian canal, which actually gives a nutrient to the developing bone. It has the nerves, it has the vessels, which will supply in due course of time. Now, what is around them in the round things? These are all the osteocytes. Which, as sir told, is actually a mature form of the osteoblast that actually making the bones. Okay. Now, if we see the same thing in a higher magnification, look, these are all the bones. This pink area, these are all the bones, and lined by here, these cells, these are all osteoblasts. Okay. And when you see this area here, as you all remember, it's a physiological giant cell. It is called as osteoclast. So, osteoblasts they are making the bones. Osteoclasts they are breaking the bones, and they both occur simultaneously in the bone. Okay, now osteoblast is a single nucleated cell, and osteoclast is a multi nucleated cell. Having understood this, let's also have a view on a cartilage. So look here. So this is basically a lower magnification view of a cartilage, and this here I have shown in a higher magnification. This is actually a chondrocyte. In this, this center one is a nucleus. So when you remember this normal histology, I can assure you, analyzing the histopathology becomes very simplified for you. I think we can now start with the classification. Let's start start with the classification, then move on. Okay, so uh, normally when we read in orthopedic class about bone tumors, we divide the bone tumors into three basic categories: the benign bone tumors, the benign aggressive tumors, those who have a potential to go into aggressive nature, and those purely aggressive, right? So if I just quickly revise the aggressive tumors, you know, I give you a simple way to revise in the class that how to revise the these malignant tumors. So only three malignant tumors you have to revise that you know. One, all the sarcomas, whatever sarcoma you know, they all are malignant. Number two is about the uh, all sarcomas. If I name them, osteo sarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, chondro sarcoma, so all sarcomas. Second malignant tumor you have to remember is the chordomas, right? Which have a predilection for the sacrum or the coccygeal area. And then third is the edmentinoma. So three malignant tumors. So easy way to revise them. When you talk of the benign aggressive tumors, those which are benign usually and have a tendency to undergo aggressive malignant transformation. So both the epiphyseal tumors, you know, number one and second osteoblastoma. So only two tumors which are benign and aggressive nature both. Right, so both epiphyseal tumor means your giant cell tumor and the chondroblastoma. So third one, osteoblastoma. Right, so three tumors here, and rest anything you know that most of them will be on the benign side. So whatever you know now, osteoblastoma, osteochondroma, non-ossifying fibroma, fibrous dysplasia, UBC, ABC, so all is benign. So what we discuss in our class, we simply say that to revise a bone tumors, to diagnose a bone tumor, theoretically, image-based section, X-ray base, anyways, you just need to know three things about bone tumors. One. What tumor occurs at what location, right? That's the most important thing. Second, which of the tumor is benign or aggressive? Because depending on the nature of the tumor, you are going to see the periosteal reaction in that particular image, right? And third is the special feature. As I as I always say, 
no tumor other than your osteochondromas or simply say chondromas and evings have more than five points no other tumor right so all the tumors have five less than five points and if you know these three things the location the nature and the spatial feature you can crack anything so when you talk of the uh, these nature we have already told you the uh, names of the tumors when you talk about the locations so let's talk about the common locations of the tumors when you say epiphyseal lesions right so giant cell tumor number one chondroblastoma two the one which is not so important from orthopedic side but might be in your pathology that is clear cell chondrosarcoma the third variant basically the chondrosarcomas don't have a predilection for epiphyses but the clear cell variant has a predilection when you come on to the metaphyseal most of the tumors you know they are important ones they are in the metaphyseal area for example the osteosarcomas number two the cystic lesions the unicameral bone cyst or the aneurysmal bone cyst then you have non ossifying fibromas right the osteoblastomas the osteochondromas these all are metaphyseal lesions when you talk of the diaphyseal four important you have to learn one osteoid osteoma fibrous dysplasia number three is having sarcoma and fourth is adventinoma that is how we learn but to just just revise that in a simple way and to correlate the orthopedics and the pathology we again can divide these tumors as being discussed now by dr pradeep so friends uh, as we know a mesenchymal tumor is what is a bone tumor a mesenchymal tumor when benign is called as oma and when it's a malignant tumor it's called as sarcoma so the same thing runs here so what we'll do is we'll divide the whole bone tumors into three ways one which actually make as you see here one which actually make the bones here okay one which make the cartilage and one which are an unknown origin so it will, if you remember this way it will be very simple and you can understand and remember the histopathology because once we will make a bone will show the bones in the histopathology one which is actually making a cartilage will show a cartilage in the histopathology and unknown origin will be completely different to altogether so when you move to the bone forming tumor of benign and a malignant so it will be osteoid osteoma osteoblastoma a malignant will be sarcoma it becomes osteo sarcoma cartilage benign malignant so benign will be say osteochondroma chondroma and chondroblastoma malignant will be chondrosarcoma got the point so oma becomes benign and sarcoma becomes malignant unknown origin will be benign or malignant in benign as a sir told some tumors are not exactly benign they are locally aggressive like a basal cell cancer you remember from the skin they are locally aggressive in the same way there is a giant cell tumor there is a annular bone cyst in the malignant counterpart completely there becomes a evins sarcoma so this how we'll discuss the whole thing in a basic point of view let's start with a radiopath correlation Okay, so uh, the first tumor that we discuss, the bone forming tumors, as sir said. So we divide these tumors into basically three categories: one which forms the bones, one which forms the cartilage, and third of unknown origin, right? The miscellaneous tumors. So number one that you see on your screen, what do you observe here? Some lesion is located in the femur, and what special thing that you can recognize that only one side of the cortex is involved. The lateral side you see is clean. If you see the lateral side, it is clean, but only one side cortex involved diaphyseal lesions. So as I said, if you want to solve anything in the bone tumors, you should know three things. One is the location, second is the nature, and third is the spatial feature. So looking at the location, what is the location of this lesion? You can easily see that there is a central lytic lesion, particularly here, this part. This lytic lesion is located in diaphyses. So the diaphyseal lesions we have discussed, they are four in number, right? Osteoid osteoma, fibrous dysplasia, you have green sarcoma, and adventinoma, four basically. So how we are going to uh, identify which is this benign or malignant? So, if you want to know the nature of the tumor, you have to see the periosteal reaction that you see around the lesion. So, what do you call this kind of reaction? If you know the basic part, how the different periosteal reactions are seen, how they are laid onto the bone, you know that this is a solid periosteal reaction, and this solid reaction is suggestive of a benign lesion. So, either it is your osteoid osteoma or non-ossifying fibroma. Fibroma, as the name is telling you, the fibrous dysplasia, sorry, not any, the fibrous dysplasia. The name, as it tells you, the fibrous dysplasia, the fibrotic changes into the bone, that will not produce any kind of bone formation or a sclerosis. Right, that should come with lysis. This is what is osteoid osteoma. So, what are the features? I said no tumor has more than five important points. If I tell you about osteoid osteoma, only three points to be remembered: one, pain, which is more at night and relieved by typically by NSAIDs, the painkillers. Why so? Because these lesions, that sir will tell you more better, that these lesions have presence of prostaglandins and cyclooxygenase in them. So, aspirin inhibits them, so the pain is relieved. So, point one, pain more at night, relieved by NSAID. Number two. Eccentric lesion surrounded by sclerosis, suggestive of solid reactions, right? And number three, the size of the nidus, the size of the central lytic lesion. It should be always less than 1.5 centimeters. If it goes more than 1.5, cannot be osteoid osteoma, right? So let's see how the pathology can be linked to it.
as dr sushil has rightly said that one of the most important part that you need to remember regarding a bone tumor is the location of the bone tumor so we talk about the long bones we all know that radiologically the bone is predominantly divided into three broad parts epiphysis metaphysis and diaphysis so always remember that whenever you are looking at a bone tumor you are you are very clear on this particular part that whether the lesion is in the epiphysis or the metaphysis or the diaphysis so if you talk about this long bone if you see this part this is the epiphysis of the long bone then if you come slightly lower then this part is the metaphysis and if you go in the shaft region that is diaphysis sometime a tumor is encroaching between the two areas then you try to look at the epicenter of that particular tumor and we in our radiological language call it as a metadiaphysial lesion but again try to make sure that which part is predominantly the tumor is involving the epicenter so if the tumor is somewhere here again it will be labeled as metaphysis but if the tumor is predominantly in this part that will be a diaphysial tumor and as dr sushil has rightly said that there are some rare tumors also but in our exam we usually get in these image based questions not very rare tumor some of the common tumors like in epiphysis if you are getting a tumor think of a chondroblastoma or a gct most likely it will be a gct if in the metaphysis benign tumors usually will be a cystic lesion something like an aneurysmal bone cyst or a simple bone cyst or a, or a unicameral bone cyst in a malignancy think of a osteosarcoma in the diaphysial lesion think of ewing sarcoma okay Okay, so now let's some of the most important tumors which are recurrent again and again asked in your exams, right? The first one we talk about is the image that you see on your screen. Now, what do you see? As Dr. Rajat just said that some of the tumors, they are predominantly metaphysial, maybe diaphysial, but they encroach upon the second areas, right? So as I rightly said, in my class, in my every class, I say simple thing that bone tumors just have one rule that there is no rule as simple as that. So bone tumors don't follow any rule. But what we have to read being an undergraduate preparing for any of the PGM exam is to learn the basic concepts. Now look at this particular x-ray. What do you see? The epiphysis seems to be clean. Metaphysical area seems to be clean. But then again, moving on towards the diaphysis, we see the lesion somewhere in between, right? So I can call it a diaphysial encroaching on the metaphysical or a metaphysical encroaching on a diaphysical or as Dr. Rajat said in a radiological language, <clears throat> the metadiaphysial lesion. Now what do you see observe in this particular area? So if I call this one as a diaphysal lesion, you know that we have basically four lesions that occur in the diaphysal area. Number one, Ewing sarcoma. Number two, adamantinoma. Those two are malignant ones. Number three, osteoid osteoma. Number four, fibrous dysplasia. So two benign and two malignant. Now how should I say that this one is a benign or a malignant lesion? For that you have to learn the nature, right? So benign tumors always have a solid reaction. Maybe no reaction at all. That is one feature. Or maybe some solid reaction. This is what you call a sclerotic reaction all around the particular infective foci or the central nidus of the infection, right? So central lytic area that you see right here and that is surrounded by a lot of sclerosis all around. That is what we call the sclerotic rim around the particular lesion, right? This lesion is nothing else other than your osteoid osteoma. How, so, uh, how we have to learn the important features? As I said, no tumor has more than five points other than your osteochondromas or the Ewing sarcoma. This one has got just two or three. What are they? Number one feature associated with osteoid osteoma is that most common complaint will be pain that is more at night and typically relieved by aspirin NSAIDs and why is that so because these lesions they have presence of prostaglandins and cyclooxygenase in them so aspirin the NSAIDs block them so pain is gone number two these are eccentric lesions on one of the cortex see the lateral side of the cortex is clean one of the cortex is involved with a sclerotic limb so eccentric lesion with lot of sclerosis all around number two and number three feature if you measure this size of this nidus on the CT scans that should be less than 1.5 centimeter, right? So ortho radio literature may vary, but somehow what they simply mean to say is that the lesion is always less than 1.5, as we say, less than 2 centimeters as the radiologists say, right? It should be less than that. If the size is increasing anyhow, if the lesion is changing the location anyhow, you have to presume that it is going into some sort of malignant transformations, right? So three important points that we need to remember from the orthopedic side. Now coming on to how they look onto, look like on the scans. See this? Now, if you see this is a different patient uh, in which again we see the radiolucent nidus. Now, there is one point that I want to highlight specifically for the exam. See, the conventionally uh, when we talk with the students, now we come across one that for all bones, CT is a very, very good investigation. But point to be noted friends, now it's a very commonly asked question in the NEET PG. Now, if you talk about intraosseous extent of a skeletal tumor, most of the skeletal tumors are best seen on MR. Now, we, because they are encroaching onto the medulla or the cancellous bone which contains bone marrow which is very well seen on MR. However, there is one tumor which is better seen on CT than MR and that is osteoid osteoma. 
So osteoderma because it is a cortical based tumor and the, the nidus is lying in the cortex and as you can see in this particular image now this blackish thing that you could see is the radiolucent nidus and surrounded by marked sclerosis. Please remember this sclerosis as Dr. Sushil has rightly said is as a marker of benign or a non-aggressive uh, lesion. So it's a classical osteoid osteoma as you can see in the femur. Now let's look at the, patholo uh, the pathology. pathology part of this tumor. So now friends as uh, we have already discussed it's a benign tumor. A benign tumor with a around about a peristal reaction. Now what you see this pinkish area, this all pink area, these all are the osteoid formation which are actually arranged in a lamellae. You see this pinkish area, these all are actually lamellae and around them you can see these small small blue cells. These are actually osteoblasts which are making these cells. Now in between these lamellae of the bone you see this area, this is the stromal area. The stromal area consists of the dilated capillaries and all the periosteal reactions are actually occurring in this area. The same image in a different sort of thing but this pink area is all the woven bones and these are the surrounding trabeculies surrounding the trabeculies these are basically the congested capillaries here so this is what you find in osteoid osteoma which remember it's a benign tumor okay so one tumor that we just discussed a bone forming tumor is osteoid osteoma now when you talk about the malignant variation of the same tumor that can form the bone is what you see on your screen the second image right as you can see now in the case of osteoid osteoma, the reaction was very simple. There was a sclerotic rim, the solid reaction that we say. But what do we observe here? Now you can see this excessive proliferative changes here. Excessive proliferative changes here all around the lower end of the femur. Right? So trabeculae, it seems like the trabeculae, they are not actually visible. There is a lot of blastic activity going on. And therefore, what actually happens in these kind of excessive proliferative reaction is that the sharpest fibers, they get stretched. And most of the time, they are perpendicular to the bone. That is what you typically call the sun ray appearance. Now what do you observe in the upper image? What do you observe is simply this thing. See this. These are lifting of the periosteum to cover up the pathology. So wherever the periosteum gets lifted up from its parent bone to cover up the pathology is what you call a Cordman's triangle. Right? So Cordman is not typically only seen in osteosarcoma. It can be seen in events. It can be seen in any of the malignant proliferations. In cases of malignancy occurring in the osteomyelitis also. Right? So wherever the periosteum gets lifted up from the parent bone to cover up the pathology is what you call a Cordman's triangle. That is osteosarcoma. So can be of two types, the primary ones or the secondary ones and the causes for secondary you already know. One of the metabolic disorders which is again one of the most important topic, the pagets. Yes? So less than 1% of the paget patient may turn up into osteosarcomas also. Other factors can be converging into osteomyelitis, maybe like your radiation therapies, so on. So primary or secondary osteosarcoma. So this is how you on x-ray you define them the sunray appearance or the cordon triangle. Let's see how the histopathology differentiate it from a benign lesion. Now friends, it's a malignant tumor. What you see here, this actually so I was saying this area, sorry, this area actually is a tumor. Okay. Now, as you see, this tumor can erode into the cortex and can even lift the periosteum above. So, I believe this area will be the cordon triangle. Okay. This, so this is the bone part. And this part is coming out. This is a triangle that's called a Cordman's triangle. Uh, in histopathology, look, it's a malignant tumor. First, understand. So, when it's a malignant tumor, you can all get the features of anaplasia, which means there can be a dysplasia features, which may be a high NC ratio. There can be hemochromatic nuclei. The mild figures, basically, they are becoming more and more atypical, bizarre type. What you see in this image, look at this area, this actually is an atypical mitosis. Why do you say so? Because it has not two poles, but more than two poles. It can be tripolar, it can be multipolar and so on. This is actually sensitive of it's a malignant tumor. Remember, whenever you see a atypical or bizarre mitosis, it always suggests there is a malignancy there. This part, remember, it's a bone forming tumor. This is why we under, I make you understood that there's some tumors which actually make bone, some tumor which make cartilage. This is a bone forming tumor. So this part here is actually a lacy. That means it's not a normal bone because a malignant cell will never make a normal bone. So this is the reason this part is actually a lacy. That means abnormal bony formation. This part is a osteoid, but it's not normal. It's a malignant. If you see an osteoid being formed by a malignant tumor cell, it is a confirmatory sign of osteosarcoma. Okay, sir, is just just explain to you that how is the benign tumors, how they look different from malignant tumors. Now one question which was uh, earlier a state level MCQ also and you might get sometimes also 
that they ask you what on histology you find when you take the histology of these bone forming tumors. So we divided the bone tumor uh, forming tumor as bone forming, cartilage forming or maybe miscellaneous. So whenever you take a histological sample of the bone forming tumors, I told you that how the bone is formed, the cell plus protein plus the minerals. So this combination of cell and protein is what you call the matrix or simply the osteoid. So if somebody wants you to define the osteoid in your medicine, in your radiology, in your pathology, in your orthopedics, you can simply say that osteoid is a combination of cell and protein or in other words, osteoid plus mineral is a bone. So osteoid is bone minus mineral, so any demineralized bone. So what I simply want to tell you is that when you take the histological sections of these osteoid osteoma or the osteosarcoma, what you are going to get is an osteoid, right? That is the answer when you get this question in your exams. We move on to the second uh, this category, the cartilage forming tumor. And the most important here, the cartilage forming tumor. Obviously, they ask you one question here, which is the most common benign bone growth, right? So we say that it is osteochondroma, isn't it? But more common than that is your non-ossifying fibromas. Non-ossifying fibromas are present in more than 30% of the children's born, but they resolve spontaneously. Most of them, they are undiagnosed, they don't need any kind of treatment. We don't even discuss them in class. That is a normal consideration, developmental anomaly basically. That will resolve with time, 30%. Right, that is a huge number. But after that, it is osteochondroma that is the most common diagnosed or identified lesion. Right, so chondromas basically, these are the tumors of the hyaline cartilage. Okay, most common location where these tumor occur is in the digits. And when they occur inside the phalanges, digits, what do you call them is enchondroma. Right, so when enchondroma, they have certain associations with other disorder, we know them by some syndromes. Number one is Olius disease. What actually is Olius disease? Olius is when you have multiple enchondromas, multiple digits are involved, right? So when you have something in a multiple location, what do you call them is a polyosphotic lesion. And that was your JIPMA 2017 MCQ, which of the tumors, they have given four tumors and they ask that which of these tumors is polyosphotic in nature, right? The option there was fibrous dysplasia although, but you must know the differential diagnosis for polyosphotic lesions. One of them is this, the Olius disease. Other one given here is Mofossi syndrome, which is enchondroma with hemangiomas, right? When these tumor occurs in, uh, in your fingers, in your digits, you call them enchondromas and when they occur outside the bone, that is what you call osteochondromas. The most common benign lesions that you see in the bones after non-ossifying fibro. Let's see how they are visible on the pathological sections. That is how the enchondromas are visible inside the phalanges, right? And let's see how they will look like on histopathological section. Yes friends, so let's now move on to the enchondroma. It's a benign cartilage forming tumor. Uh, as you remember, a normal cartilage, usually what we describe in histopathology is it's a spectacle-like cell. So it has a cell with a two nuclei. And when you see, look at these cells all over here, these are the benign chondrocytes. Okay. A benign chondrocyte has a cap here of a bone. So this pink area is a bone, which is well-formed bone. And these are all benign chondrocytes. And hence it is called as n chondroma. Sometimes what happens, this n chondroma might undergo peripheral calcification. Sometimes, not always though. And sometimes the central area might undergo infarction. So these are the complications which actually an enchondroma can actually go. So basically it's a benign chondrocytes which is might be covered by a layer of bones. <coughs> now let's talk about this tumor which is the osteochondroma. Now we talk about this osteochondroma as you can see that there is a bony protrusion as you could see now from the metaphysis and which is projecting away from the joint. Now one of the typical names that is given to them is a coat hanger deformity. That's a classical coat hanger deformity. Now in terms of an MCQ, now this is a benign tumor but some people consider that's not a true tumor. So there are a lot of controversies. Some say most common benign tumor of the bone is osteochondroma. Then some say that it is not a true tumor and the most common benign tumor is osteodosteoma. So you have to see the exact language of the MCQ. You have to see the exact uh, the question and the exact choices and according to that you have to pick it up. Now but let's talk about this. So as you can see as I told you one more MCQ coat hanger deformity. The second thing is that which is not very well appreciable on this radiograph is for which we require an MR is that they are surrounded by a cartilage cap. Okay and normally in the benign tumor this cartilage cap is less than one centimeter in size. Okay but in, in, a, in a malignant tumor it becomes more than 2 cm. 1 to 2 cm in radiology we consider as borderline. We see many patients in which there is rapid increase in the size that is also an ominous sign that it may go into the malignant conversion. But the, the radiological criteria that we consider on MR is the thickness of the cartilaginous cap more than 2 cm is a sign of malignant conversion in an osteochondroma. Okay. So just to add to it, 
just to add to it this particular image that just Dr. Rajat has just shown you, just to add to it the important points that you must remember while you are revising those osteochondroma. Number one, this tumor is, as he said, this tumor is considered to be the most common benign anomaly, but not a true benign tumor. Number one. Number two, it grows with the skeleton and there is no further growth after the skeletal maturity. Now, as we said, that anything going away from a normal route, consider it to be going into malignant transformation. So when it starts growing after the skeletal maturity, that again is a sign of malignant transformation, right? That may be a sign of malignant transformation. Number three, he already said that stock goes away from the joint line, right? So the question, when they ask you, they may ask you that all of these are the possible complication of particular osteochondroma except. So one of the odd option they often give you is a degenerative arthritis. See, arthritis occurs, involves a joint. So when the stock is away from the joint, there is no point that it can go into the joint and cause degenerative arthritis, right? So it grows with the skeleton, no growth after the maturity. Second point, that other thing that you have to remember, that most common complication which may be related to this osteochondroma, it can be pathological fractures. Number two, malignant transformations. Number three can be bursitis. Number four can be the nerve compressions, right? But not the joint arthritis, right? Friends, osteochondroma, look at this pathology here. So this basically is a narrow cavity. This pink area is a narrow cavity. Above them, this area is a bony part. And this whole narrow cavity is being continuous out into the osteochondroma. Then there comes the bony part and above them there is a cartilage cap. So there is a cartilage cap, there is a bone, there is a marrow. Exactly same thing we should prove on the histopathology. So this is what it is. So this is the cartilage part. It might have a perichondrium outside. This is the cartilage part. This is the bony part. This pink area is the bony part. And here is the marrow. So there is a marrow, there is a bone, there is a cartilage, there is a perichondrium. If you see these three things, it becomes osteochondroma. Okay, so these are the bone forming and the cartilage. That is how we divide them. Now coming on to something very special, the tumor of unknown origin you can say or the miscellaneous tumor you can say. The number one on your screen, something very very typical, a recent MCQ which was there and for which there was a lot of you know mistakes being uh, uh, spread on the social media that the option was GCT, osteoclastom, both were given. How to differentiate that from other tumors like that. So what typical do you think it is? Lower end of radius, typical location with a lytic lesion with multiple septaries inside. What do you call this? Typical, the soap bubble appearance, isn't it? So what it becomes? It is giant cell tumor. Nothing else other than giant cell tumor. Now this giant cell tumor, basically the age group for that is 20 to 40 years, right? How we differentiate that from the aneurysmal bone cyst? Both can have lytic lesions. Both may have multiple septations into the cavity. The first and the most important thing again comes is the location. Giant cell tumor, epiphyseal, aneurysmal bone cyst, metaphyseal. That is the first point, right? In rare cases, the giant cell tumor may occur at the metaphyseal area also in the skeletally immature patient. That is a rare thing, right? So giant cell tumor with soap bubble, epiphyseal, ABC will occur at metaphyseal region. That is an important thing to be differentiated. Okay, the soap bubble appearance, when you feel these lesions, when you try to palpate these lesions, when you press over the bone, you feel like something crushing of the egg. That is what you call eggshell crackling, right? And for these tumors, the simple treatment is curettage and bone grafting. Sometimes special treatment is given to you and that special treatment is putting bone graft here and then putting the bone cement because people may might, might be fond of bone cement rather than bone graft. Now what is the harm in putting a bone cement directly here is that bone cement when they are mixed with the liquids, they liberate a lot of heat, right? Exothermic reactions that may cause damage to this particular joint area, right? So what people do, those who are fond of bone cement using bone cement, what they do, they put some layer of bone graft here and over that they put the bone cement. That is what you call the sandwich technique. The sandwich technique of treatment is followed in this particular tumor. That is what you call giant cell tumor. So one, 20 to 40, second epiphyseal, third soap bubble, fourth simple excision, curettage and bone grafting is a treatment. Sandwich technique is what you follow. And if it is going into malignant transformation, the rate for which is less than 5 to 10 percent, excise it, wide margin and then replace it with fibula. That is a normal orthopedic part. And uh, for the students, I want to specify here because we are getting a lot of fact based questions. Soap bubble appearance we all know is characteristic for joint cell tumor but on a radiograph. If you get this on MRI of the brain, it will be cryptococcomas. And if you get in the abdomen, it is meconium ileus. Okay. So that is, these are the kind of MCQs that we are getting lot of times. Make sure that you are not committing this mistake. One more point that I would like to add here that the giant cell tumor, it's a well-defined tumor, subarticular just below the joint and it is characterized by absence of sclerosis. So, absence of sclerosis is a very, very important feature of a giant cell tumor. So, friends, it's an osteoclastoma you're talking about. Osteoclastoma, as I told you at the starting, is osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are a multinucleate cell. 
what you see here, this cell actually has a multiple nucleus. The number of nucleus in this cell can range from 10 to over 100. Okay, so this is actually an osteoclast. There can be multiple osteoclasts, like you see here. Again, you see this image, this osteoclast, this is actually an osteoclast, and this also is an osteoclast. Around them, you see this area. These are actually the oval shaped tumor cells. Now, these tumor cells are very difficult to differentiate it from the osteo, normal osteoblasts. Okay, so that might be a problem. So, it has also been an AIMS question. What are the tumor cells? Remember here, the tumor cells are not these giant cells. The tumor cells are all over here. And these are the oval shaped cells. The nuclei of which might look like an osteoblast. Okay, so moving on to the next one, the tumor of unknown origin continuing in that. So benign one was your giant cell, benign aggressive tumor. And this one is your purely aggressive tumor. Typical appearance visible on your screen. So typical appearance which bone is involved, you can easily appreciate the tibia here and the fibula through the tibia. You can see that. But see this, multiple layers are being shared over the bone. This is what you call the onion peel or the laminated appearance, right? So these are multiple layers of the periosteum which are trying to cover up the pathology. And this is what you see in Ewing sarcoma. Ewing's is the another important tumor in which I said all tumors, most of the tumors have less than 5 points. Ewing's is the second one important that has got more than 5 points. It's every part is important. The prognostic factors, the histological variations and the clinical points. So age group <coughs> in which we can see the Ewing's sarcoma is 5 to 30, the first to third decade we say. But most commonly presenting in between the first and second decade, between 5 to 15. Right, that is the age group. Now one uh, important point is that Ewing's is read traditionally as a diaphyseal tumor. But it is actually a metaphyseal tumor. Right? It arises from the metaphyses, continues over the diaphyses and so usually there are no skip lesions seen in Ewing sarcoma which is not a case with the osteosarcomas. Osteosarcoma can show you the skip lesions, multiple lesions, right? Ewing's doesn't show you that, right? So origin is basically metaphyseal extending into the diaphyseal area. That is what is producing your onion peel appearance or the laminated appearance of the bone. So 5 to 15 and the laminated or the onion peel appearance, two important points about the Ewing sarcoma and then the more important point comes in your histological evaluation of this particular tumor. Uh, Ewing sarcoma basically it's a primitive neuroectodermal tumor. Nowadays the Ewing sarcoma family tumors have been clubbed into the neuroectodermal tumor. tumor. Neuro, primitive neuroectodermal tumor actually means a cell was going to make a nerve was stopped in between and has now moved to make a tumor. And hence it is called as primitive neuroectodermal tumor. Peanuts as you all remember it is also like a medulloblastoma in the brain. So this is one other example, Ewing sarcoma. Ewing sarcoma is logical consists of these small round blue cells. These all are small round blue cells. And if you look at this cytoplasm, this, uh, this white area. So around the cytoplasm is usually clear. The clear cytoplasm, look this blue is a nucleus, this white one is a clear cytoplasm. It usually comes because of the glycogen inside. So because there is a glycogen in the cytoplasm of the cell, they are usually are pass positive. Very frequently asked question is, what is the most specific marker? It is MIC2 is also positive for C99. Sometimes what happens, a primitive neurocardial tumor can form a rosette. A rosette here is called as homerite rosette. This, if you remember, it's a pseudo rosette consisting of neuropil, that is a secretion of nerve at the center. So that might be seen in a having sarcoma. So uh, friends, uh, few, uh, few, few more points about these bone tumors which are um, uh, standard MCQs and which are more of fact based MCQs as we have covered most of the points. Uh, one of them is that, uh, that what about the Ewing sarcoma, that it is considered to be the most common tumor of the flat bones. We were talking about the long bones, but if somebody, see sometimes it twists the question. Now we are talking about the most common, but if they specifically are the most common tumor of the flat bone, most common malignant tumor of the flat bone, it will become an Ewing sarcoma. And as Dr. Praveen has rightly said, that they are peanuts. Okay, one. Second is that about the the uh, the malignancies. Now, one of the the point about the malignancies is that once you diagnose a malignant bone tumor, the radiological workup becomes an important part, and uh, you should always scan the entire bone because sometimes a radi normally a radiograph is more than sufficient to make the diagnosis for most of the tumor. But once you have a tumor like an osteosarcoma, and as Dr. Sushil has said that that they have uh, skip lesions, so you should always do an MR to. Uh, to, uh, to see the skip lesions, biopsy becomes an important part and that is what is suggested by the radiological uh, information that you should do a biopsy and preferably from, uh, from the area which will be targeted or which will be decided by the MR. Then the role of CT chest, they all, they, the malignant tumor, they known to metastasize to the CT chest and we should go and we should do a CT chest in these cases. One specific point about osteosarcoma that I want to mention is that when we talk about lung metastasis, 
as a rule lung metastasis does not show calcifications but osteosarcoma is slightly unique in that that the metastasis from osteosarcoma shows calcification uh, during our days we used to, to to learn it like that if you see a known calcific metastasis in the lung search for an osteosarcoma in the body that is that is considered to be so characteristic for osteosarcoma one second important point about the metastasis of the osteosarcoma in the lung is they are usually subplural and because they are subplural they tend to rupture into the pleural cavity and their metastasis may be associated with pneumothorax so two specific points specifically for the mcq fact based mcq that metastasis to the lung in osteosarcoma can have calcification and the metastasis of the osteosarcoma to the lung can have presence of pneumothorax okay so this is our, our attempt to discuss all the mcqs related to the bone tumors and i hope that it will be very very helpful for you in the upcoming neat exam and for understanding the concepts of this with this as you all know that we are coming up with our apps e gurukul platform which will help you in taking care of all your needs at the uh, in your mobile at your convenient time and for more such videos we will be having multiple videos on such including with the with the complete subject apps of individual subject so download e gurukul which will be launching in january 2019 with this we all wish you a very best of luck for the upcoming neat exam may you all do very well in the exam thank you very thank much you. for the exam Thank you.